Well, good evening and happy new year. Uh, I'm excited to start the new year uh, with you guys on these Wednesday nights. Hopefully, as you came in or as Kenny went around, you have a, a sheet that you can take some notes on, um, both front and back. Um, there's going to be some valuable stuff. We're starting a new series tonight, and that is going to be a, I think it's going to be about a six-part series, but if, if the trend goes, probably be seven or eight, <laughs> I don't know, 12, something like that. No. Um, probably a six-part series on how to study the Bible. Um, the Bible is the most valuable book ever printed, but yet the most undervalued. It is the all-time, of all ages, in every country across the world, it is the best seller, but also the most underread. And, and the most misunderstood. It is the most often quoted piece of literature, but also the most underread and misunderstood. And um, there, are, there are reasons for that. There, you know, the Bible is not because it was written so long ago and to a culture and people that's very different from ours. Um, there, there is some reason for misunderstanding and and misquoting and, and, and misapplying. Uh, but there is no reason for lack of reading the Bible. If you were here Sunday, I challenged all of us to make 2020 a, a, a year or the year of reading the Bible. Perhaps this is the year that you're going to read the Bible through Genesis to Revelation. Uh, or maybe that's just too much for you. Uh, read the New Testament through. Um, um, Maybe that is even too much, but 2020 should be a year of reading the Bible, regular reading the Bible. If you read 15 minutes a day, you could read the entire Bible in uh, nine months or less. <clears throat> um, I mentioned Sunday, it only takes 72 hours to read the Bible out loud really slowly, because that's what audio Bibles are. Uh, there's the 72 hours of audio on an audio Bible, and they read really, really slowly. <laughs> So, um, but the Bible that you have in your hand or is under the chair or on your phone or wherever you access scriptures uh, came at the cost of lives, at the cost of lives, that we have the Bible in, in English to read in many different translations, came at the cost of many, many lives. Um, Translation of the Bible into specifically English started with a man named John Wycliffe, who was born in the 1300s, um, died in the 1400s. And when he first proposed this idea of translating the Bible into English, it was very much opposed. The church did not want the Bible to be in the hands uh, and, and on the lips of lay people. Uh, it, it was only accessible in Latin at that point, um, and only the learned, the educated, the scholars uh, had access to it, and they would deliver uh, it to the common people. But John Wycliffe said, no, uh, it, it needs to be accessible to everyone. And so he went about translating the Bible into English for the first time. The church was highly opposed to that, but they, but they refrained from arresting or excommunicating him because the people loved him. He was a, he was a dearly loved um, <clears throat> church leader. However, by way of retribution, 30 years after his death, they dug up his bones and they burned them and they threw them in the river. Probably, probably more symbolic uh, than anything. I don't, think, I don't think John Wycliffe felt anything at that point. Uh, <clears throat> now, however, William Tyndale. Now, John Wycliffe's Bibles were uh, in, the early, in the early 1400s. Uh, maybe late 1300s, so before the printing press. So they were hand-copied. And so there weren't very many copies of them. The church could easily scoop them up and burn them, and that was it. Uh, then came uh, William Tyndale. William Tyndale was born <clears throat> in the late 1400s, after uh, Gutenberg's movable-type printing press. Uh, maybe it wasn't movable type, maybe it was just etch. But regardless, the printing press, where you could mass-produce pages upon pages upon pages. 
Uh, and he translated the Bible into English to be printed. And he was burned alive because of it. The fact that you have access to an English Bible at all is remarkable and has come at the expense of many lives. The fact that we have the kind of unprecedented access that we do uh, is, unher- is just remarkable. But <clears throat> what we're going to talk about is how to study the Bible. How to study the Bible. Well, if, if we um, are going to approach God's Word, how should we do that? H- how should we approach it? Um, now again, uh, or, uh, let me just clarify, we are, we are already presupposing that the Bible is not a bunch of myths or fables or fairy tales, but the Bible is the divine Word of God, authored, uh, written by God, written down by man, and uh, it, it is God's revelation to us and is our highest, um, highest rule of, uh, highest authority of uh, faith and life. Sorry, I got that. I got a little gap there. It's our highest authority of faith and life. Um, so when we approach the Bible after all of those presuppositions that it's the Word of God, Our first step, step one, is going to be interpretation. Interpretation. Interpretation can be defined as or or described as discovering and understanding the meaning of a text. Uh, You can find a pen in the chair rack in front of you, uh, the chair pocket in front of you, and you can write that down in that first blank. Discovering and understanding the meaning of the text. Um, So, as you read the Bible, don't ask, how can I apply this to my life? Yes, that's right. You heard me correctly. When you read the Bible, don't ask, how can I apply this to my life? Don't ask, what does this mean to me? But rather, your first question should be, what is the meaning of of this text. Because, yes, you should eventually ask, how can I apply this to my life? But not until you understand the meaning of the text. <clears throat> and when we say the meaning, this is what we mean. Uh, the, the goal of interpretation, so that's the next blank. The goal of interpretation is that the reader's understanding would be the same as the author's intended meaning. <clears throat> Have you ever sent a text that even though it was written correctly, no autocorrect, no misspelling, even though it was written correctly, it was interpreted in a way other than you, att- you intended? Has that ever happened? Right. All the time. That is why my official position is that Texting is the worst form of communication ever, especially between married couples, okay? I'm, I'm telling you, in the counseling room, they come in, and, and, and we kind of get down to it, and we start peeling back the onion, and we find out that they do a lot of their communication via texting. Nope, not anymore. Not anymore, you don't. <laughs> use, use vocal words. Oh, it's horrible. Anyway, um, even... Even with emojis, it's still, it's still not enough. Not enough. Okay, so um, essentially that the reader's understanding would be the same as the author's intended message. So the idea is that in this text conversation, that what you meant to say, or rather what you meant to communicate, is also what the person that you're sending that text to is understanding it to be, right? Um, so... We're not going to ask the question, what does this mean to me? We're not going to jump straight to, how can I apply this to my life? But we're going to ask the question, what did Paul mean when he wrote? What did Luke mean when he wrote? What did Jesus mean when he said? Okay, that is going to be the goal. 
that our understanding would be the same as the intended meaning uh, of the author. Um, we do this kind of interpretation all the time, uh, not only in text messages, but if you've ever followed instructions to assemble a piece of furniture or a toy. So basically, I'm talking to the ladies. Um, if you've ever followed the actual instructions, Jim. Pictures, pictures okay. But even pictures, even pictures, you have to understand what these different arrows and what these different movements or whatever or motions or uh, little uh, animations or whatever, what they mean. You have to understand what they're attempting to communicate. If you just say, oh, what I, well, what this means to me is that, you know, I'm going to use this screw instead of this or this washer instead of this one or I'm going to put the legs on this way. It's not going to it's not going to work out. The, the goal is, when you're following some instructions, is that you have to, um, you're seeking to understand the meaning of the manufacturer for proper assembly. And so that is interpretation, that we are seeking to understand uh, what the author intended the meaning to be. Now, we're going to move on again here to the next one. We're talking about the importance of interpretation. The importance of interpreta interpretation. Well, first and foremost, proper interpretation uh, leads to growth and change. Proper interpretation leads to growth and change. I'm going to share with you a couple of verses, and Pastor Zach and I were just discussing these verses over lunch yesterday um, as we are seeking to formulate uh, or... or um, yeah, formulate a uh, discipleship uh, uh, process or uh, method uh, for, for the ministry here. Uh, uh, Colossians 1, 9 and 10. Take a listen here. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all, through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you might live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing good fruit, growing in the knowledge of God, so on and so forth. And this is echoed again if you just turn back to Philippians. I'm sorry, by turn back I meant just one page. Um. Also in Philippians 1, 9 and 10, Paul says similarly, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, 10, so that, this would result in that, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, uh, filled with the fruits of righteousness that come through Jesus Christ to the glory of, and the praise of God. And so, the importance of interpretation is the progression that you see down there with the arrows. Interpretation leads to proper understanding and to knowledge and then to insight and then to growth and change. In the same way that properly following the manufacturer's directions or instructions is going to result in a functional toy or piece of furniture or whatever it is that you're attempting to assemble. Interpretation leads to understanding, which leads to knowledge and insight, and then growth and change. Um, <clears throat> okay, I want to move on to our next section here, but you see that white space in the bottom of the page. I would like for you to do a little bit, do a little bit of experiment for me. Grab a writing instrument, if you will, and in that bottom area, just at the bottom of the page, I would like you to draw for me, for yourself, what I'm about to read to you. So I'm going to read to you something, and I would like you to illustrate that, okay? So let's do this. Here we go. So in that space below, you're going to draw what I'm going to read. Very good? Okay, here we go. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty 
had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So, you, you, you go ahead and, and draw a picture of that. Okay? Go ahead and, and draw a picture of that. I will read it for you one more time. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now, we're not looking for a Michelangelo here. We're not looking for any kind of Van Gogh. Just trying to get the basic gist of it. I'm taking a little bit of a risk here. I know. I'm looking for a specific outcome, and I hope I get it. Who needs more time? No one's going to admit they need more time. I see pencils moving, and no one is admitting that they need more time. To do, thank you very much. Okay. Let me read it one more time just for all of us. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Okay. So. I hope this works. Proper interpretation. Here we go. Back to our notes. Proper interpretation protects us from assumptions. Assumptions. How many of you drew Humpty Dumpty in the shape of an egg? Why? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything about an egg. But no, but this Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. I, I, I didn't say anything about an egg. How many of you, how many of you illustrate horses attempting to put Humpty Dumpty back together? But that's what it says, folks. All the king's horses... And the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Why didn't any of you draw horses trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? So, this is an illustration. Listen. This, this is a wonderful... We, we can show our pictures later. This... This is a wonderful example of how we bring assumptions to a text. This text says nothing about Humpty Dumpty in the shape of an egg or being an egg or, or even that he is a human. Humpty Dumpty could be a statue that fell off and broke. I don't know how horses can attempt to put anything back together. They, they have hooves. I'm not really sure how that would go. But we bring our own assumptions. And proper interpretation can protect us from assumptions. For example, some kind of assumptions that we can have are assumptions, assumptions rather, that we have been falsely taught. We have been falsely taught certain assumptions. And maybe you haven't been taught this, but I know these are being taught. For example, God wants me to be happy. That God's number one, or at least certainly high on his priority list, is my comfort and my happiness. And that drives the decisions I make, and it drives the way I interpret Scripture. If I come to Scripture with an assumption that God wants me to be happy, then anything that I see in Scripture that causes me discomfort, I'm going to reinterpret. How about this? Uh, falsely taught assumptions that praying a prayer will save you. That, that somehow magic words that we say will result in 
salvation. I know many have been taught this. Or how about this one? That the gospel is only for the salvation of lost people. The gospel is for all sinners, and that's lost and saved both. And it is, a, it, and it is the duty and responsibility of believers to be reminding, to be uh, preaching to themselves, to be reapplying, not in a salvific way, but reapplying in a sanctifying way the gospel to their lives every day. Another assumption that we have will be um, fleshly, selfish assumptions where because we want to sin in our flesh, that's what we want, we will reinterpret Scripture. And we are seeing this happen today all the time. We are seeing the reinterpretation, or that should be rather said, the misinterpretation of Scripture because of what culture demands, uh, because, of, because of what sin demands. God says that's sinful. Uh, well, you're just misinterpreting it. You know, if you really understood it the way it was you know, supposed, to be in, supposed to be understood, then you'd, then you'd interpret it this way. All that does is satisfy your fleshly desires. It reinterprets the Bible to fleshly desires. So, step one is interpretation. Uh, in addition to that, on the back, I wanted to give you some tools to help you. Now, we are going to be walking through more skills, but I wanted to give you some tools tonight uh, and, and recommend resources for you. So, if you want to flip to the back of that, here are some tools. First of all, if you're going to study the Bible, you're going to need a Bible, okay? So that's step one. If you don't have a Bible, um, you'll find one in the seat rack in front of you. Take it. Just let us know so we can, so we can replace it. Uh, but, but it's good to have a Bible. Now, those are, those are fine Bibles. Uh, there, are, there are different Bibles. So um, get a good translation of the Bible. Get a good translation of the Bible. Now, what's a good translation of the Bible? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a pin in that just for one moment. I'm going to look at the second one, okay? In addition to the translation that you read and, and study out of that would be a good translation, you should also have access to other translations. Knowing or understanding that Bible translation is a spectrum, okay? There is no perfect translation of the Bible, because every translation is going to have to give to, to, to one side or another. Okay? If, if we translated the Hebrew and the Greek and the little bit of Aramaic that is in the Bible through Google Translate, okay, it would be unreadable because things would be you know, all backwards because the construction of sentences in these other languages are different than they are in our language, uh, in, in, in English or in many languages. So <clears throat> what you have there b before you is these one, two, three, four different lines, four different spectrums that a um, Bible translation could fall on, okay? So for example, on, on the one hand, let me see if I have this right. Okay, on the one hand, you, oh, I really can't move too much, can I? On the one hand, you have original language, okay? How close to the original language can we get versus how close to the modern language can we get, all right? Or how about this one? Um, replication versus readability. Are we just going to replicate the Greek and the Hebrew into English words or are we going to go for readability, like, you know, putting them in sentence structure and so we can understand what they're saying? Um, one involves strict translation, and the other requires interpretation. 
It requires interpretation. It requires not just connecting the dots word for word, but you have to say, okay, what is this sentence saying? And then rewriting that sentence in, in English. But that is interpretation. Sort of the, the scholarly way of saying that would be formal equivalency and then functional equivalency. But there's also even a third one beyond that, and that's free translation. Okay, Pastor Don, thanks for that, but could you put some, uh, you know, actual versions of the Bible along with that? All right, well, I will do my best, and, um, and everyone will not be happy, uh, because I'll probably uh, not, not get it right. So, <clears throat> our... In our English Bibles, what we have available to us, I would probably say that the uh, NASB, the, also the, 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 the NASB, the New American Standard, would be probably one of the more strict um, translation closer to the original language. Um, so on this, that would be the left side, the NASB, okay? Over on this side like probably off the chart, I mean off the page even, would be, would be versions, they're not even versions, they are, trans, they are paraphrases, like the Message or the Living Bible, okay? Their attempt is not to translate, their attempt is to rephrase the Bible, okay? But if we're going to come back and actually get on the scale um, toward readability or interpretation, um, uh, Right in the middle, I've always thought that the middle is, you know what, I, I'm not going to say what the middle is, because I, I, don't think, I don't think there is kind of a dead middle anymore. So where was I? So over here, I would say, is the NIV. So just to the, just to the right of middle would be the NIV. Just to the left of middle is probably the ESV. Uh, it's a little bit truer to the original languages, um, but it does sacrifice a little bit of readability. Um, if I begin to go down the list, I'm, I'm probably going to get lost in, 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 in where they are. I do have a printout, and we're going to probably talk about translations maybe a little bit later uh, in, in more depth, but of, of the big, oh, I haven't mentioned the New Living Translation, so where am I? New, the, the New Living Translation would be to the right of the NIV, but not quite a free translation. It's close, but it's not quite a free translation. Um, so that would be... That would be not only my opinion, but that would also probably be fairly scholarly opinions. And listen, that is only, what, five of who knows how many translations there are. Um, so tools that you would need for Bible study, for Bible interpretation, if you're going to walk down this road, a good translation of the Bible, other translations of the Bible, knowing that they fall on a spectrum that this might be a little bit more closely to what the original language says, and this one might be a little bit more loose to convey the point. Um, but that comes at a cost, right? Um, sometimes there could be sort of, a, sort of a play on words, right, with a, uh, with a saying. So, um, for example, if, if I were to arrive in time before you to a location. Okay? I arrived ahead of you. Okay? Um, let's say we were running a race and, and, I, and I got into the building by my head just before you. I got, ahead, I got there ahead of you. Ah, ah, ah. You know what I'm saying? So for example, no, no, hang on. In the Greek, to arrive somewhere before, in time, at a location, than someone else, you arrive before their face. 
I don't know why they say that. That, that that's, just the, that's just what they use, okay? One translation over here will say, so, you know, he arrived, he arrived before my face. They will translate the words. One over here will say, oh, he got there ahead of him. Well, one communicates more clearly, but also loses the actual words. What if there is a play on words? What if there's a, what if there's a, a, a specific reason that they chose those words, right? I got there ahead of him would be completely lost. And I don't know if that has any significance, but we'll never know if it has significance if we abandon the words just for the meaning. And so it always comes with cost. Okay, um, so another tool might be a, uh, an app or a website. Again, we live in unprecedented times of access to Scripture. Um, websites that I would recommend, BibleGateway.com, uh, BibleHub.com, BibleStudyTools.com, BlueLetterBible.com. Um, now, I can't guarantee that every resource on there is going to be fantastic, and there are other good websites as well, but those are ones that I have frequented. Apps that you can download to your phone or tablet would be Uversion, that's the Bible app. Um, Bible Gateway has a um, <clears throat> has an app uh, to correspond to their website. Literal Word is one that I stumbled across recently that is fantastic. You can, you can click on a word and you can see it in its original language and where it's used elsewhere in Scripture and what the meaning is. It's, it's really great. It's based off the, the NASB, the NASB translation, Literal Word, and it's got a great interface too. It's really great. Um, and then, of course, there's the Blue Letter Bible app that goes along with the blueletterbible.com, although the app is not as uh, fully featured. Um, another tool that I would recommend would be to get a good study Bible. Now, again, I, I make a qualifier as a good study Bible. A study Bible, again, is going to drive you to the meaning of the text. There are life application study Bibles. To me, that's a bit of an a oxymoron. It's a bit of a contradiction because you're skipping a step, right? If, if the study notes at the bottom of the page jump straight to how you can apply this to your life but bypass having a proper understanding of it, then it's done you a bit of a disservice. So I'm not a huge fan of life application study Bibles, Okay? Nor am I a fan of the men's Bible and the women's Bible and the kids' Bible and the fisherman's Bible and the hunter's Bible and the crafty lady's Bible. And the, do you know what Bible is for men and women and children? The Bible. Okay? We don't need, because a lot of times the articles or the little extra things in there don't drive you to the text. They're devotional in nature and they distract you from the text. Okay? Um, we have a hard enough time reading Scripture, spending time reading Scripture. We don't need to spend time reading, here's how Joe in the tree stand, you know, spent his days thinking about God. Um, they have their purpose, maybe, uh, but not for Bible study. So get a good study Bible. Um, I can recommend the ESV study Bible. I can recommend the NIV Zondervan study Bible. Um, I mean, I don't know how many you need, but those two are fantastic. Uh, and, and they come in different. I mean, you can get goat's skin, leather, fancy, $110, or you can buy the hardback for $24, you know, uh, but they are great. And both of them have apps that once you buy the book, you can have access to it on your tablet or, or um, uh, a computer. All right, a couple more. A Bible dictionary to help you to define some words that are used in Scripture and how they're used in Scripture. Because again, I mean, love defined by the world versus love defined in Scripture, Okay. And it goes on from there. A Bible handbook would help with cultural and historical backgrounds. We have extra copies of Bible handbooks and Bible dictionaries. If you want to borrow one, uh, we have them. And then Bible commentaries. Um, I'm, what do I have on here? Um, you could get a one-volume commentary of the Bible. Moody's, uh, Moody has a one-volume commentary on the Bible. It's one book. 
In my library, I have a two-volume commentary on the Bible. It's Old Testament and New Testament. I have a 12-volume commentary of the entire Bible. But I also have individual books. So you could get a 66-volume uh, commentary on the Bible, just buying individual ones. I'm not saying those are required, but those are great tools. And as long as you return them, and I don't need them immediately, you can borrow any book in my library, okay? Um, but in addition to those, there are also some free commentaries online, Matthew Henry's notes, John Calvin's commentaries on the Bible, as well as Charles Spurgeon's sermons are pretty readily available for free online, okay? Now, uh, just like anything else uh, that is worth doing, uh, it is worth putting time into. It is not expected that you would master the Bible in your first reading or your fifth. It is a lifetime. It is like becoming proficient in a uh, musical instrument or a skill, you know. Uh, Ron wasn't good at the piano the first time he sat down, nor was he good at the accordion the first time his grandma put it in his hands. Uh, <coughs> here, squeeze this, right? Familiarity and knowledge of the scriptures is like learning a person. Now, I'm, I'm not giving personality to the Bible, but, I'm a, but I am saying in the same way that there is seemingly endless depth of a person to get to know, there is endless, endless, endless depth in the scriptures to get to know. It is a lifelong pursuit. And don't get discouraged if you don't understand it your first time through, your fifth time through, your tenth time through because that's not expected. What is expected is that you become a little bit more familiar every time. And so I look forward to going through and uh, with you over these weeks to just give you a little bit of insight and help on how to demystify the Scriptures. All right? Let's pray, and we'll be done. Father, thank you for a chance to consider um, your Word, uh, not necessarily in your Word, but about your Word and its value. God, I pray that we would not be numbed by the easy access to Scripture, but not read it. God, I pray that this year would be a year of um, Scripture reading, uh, that we would be consuming your, your Word and your truth through the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen.